morning, Crossroads. Welcome to church. Holy Week is coming up really quick, and I want to remind you all the events we have going on. April 17th, which is a Wednesday, we're going to have baptisms. If you haven't been baptized, I encourage you to come out and get baptized. This is the perfect opportunity. It'll be at North Campus at 6.30 p.m. Then Good Friday, April 19th, we're going to have two services. At noon at North Campus, and then at South Campus at 6.30 p.m. Good Friday service will help give you perspective on what we're celebrating the following Sunday on Easter. So I encourage you to come out. And then on Easter Sunday, we're going to have three services. The sunrise service at 6.30 a.m. at North. Pastor Josh will be preaching then. And then North Campus at 8.30, Pastor Andrew West will be teaching. And at 10.30 a.m. at South Campus, Pastor Andrew West will be teaching there as well. Don't forget to bring a friend and your family. We have a special guest today, Pastor Grayson Kesnick. Thanks, Maria. You're awesome. Hey, guys, wanted to invite you to come out this Tuesday, April 2nd, for our Men's First Tuesday event. We will be hearing from Pastor Ryan A. Duffy Esquire III. He'll be teaching on humble confidence, the mark of a godly man, how to avoid the pitfalls of pride and arrogance while being a bold and confident leader. We'll have worship and food, and you don't need to sign up, so just come on out. We want to see you there. Thanks. Thanks, Grayson. Also want to remind you that on Monday, April 1st, the Legacy Christian School Info Night will be happening at South Campus at 6.30 p.m. Registration is now open for the school, so if you have any questions, I encourage you to come out. There will also be dessert. We have many other announcements, so don't forget to look at your bulletin, go online for more information, or ask a friend. <laughs> <laughs> ah. We are also looking for some live camera operators for our normal church services. So if you're interested, you feel a call from the Lord, go into the church office and get some more information or contact Pastor Grayson. Hope you guys have a great service. Well, good morning, Crossroads. See how easy it is to run a camera? Huh? <laughs> Nothing to it. So sign up if you would, please. Hey, uh, if you happen to drive here this morning in a truck, there is a one that's got their headlights on, apparently just on the other side of the office, that's got, I think, a rack on the roof. So if that's yours... Wait about three minutes so nobody knows it's yours, and then run out of here and go shut them off, okay? Uh, okay, we've got a couple of things that we want to give you guys an update on. A number of you folks have asked me about our mission trip back in January to India and how that went. Let me do a little bit of a recap and a reiteration of it, and then we're going to show you a video. Um, so these medical missions that we take to India, we do about every 18 months or so. And India, his laws are written in such a fashion that what's considered religious work needs to be differentiated and kept very separate from what's called um, uh, social work. Okay, And so the medical camp is under the classification of social work. A crusade would be under the classification of religious work. The thought in the, in the Indian mindset is that you don't coerce someone to come to Christ, basically, by providing them good medical care. So we do this medical camp, and then about a month later, Prabhadas and Ruth go back with members of their church, and they'll do a crusade following up on the medical camp. There's three aspects to a medical camp. One of them is eye clinic, the other one is the dental clinic, and then the third one is the medical clinic. Um, we are helping people in India that are rural and kind of destitute. So a lot of these people have never seen a doctor before in their life. This past year, uh, Dr. Kevin Maxwell really took a strong interest in the medical side of the medical camp and helped us out there quite dramatically. And just to give you an idea of what transpired over the course of the week that we were there seeing patients. And over the course of a week, we might see a total of like 88,000 patients, 80,000, well, that would be way too much, but 8,000 <laughs> patients. 
Um, and so it's, it's, that's enough in and of itself over the course of five or six days. But we had, in the medical camp alone, medical patients, we saw 1,200. That's over double from last year. Last year we saw 500, this year 1,200. We were able to distribute and have made for people 1,790 glasses. We gave away about 900 readers and we had about 560 cataract surgeries done. And usually with these Indians, cataracts are so mature that they are blind, literally. And so we, by God's grace, are able to give them the gift of sight by having cataract surgeries done. So one of the doctors that happened to come along this time is, is into multimedia. And he put together a little video kind of expressing what a, what, a, what a medical camp was like. And this will give you a little flavor of it, so if you could run that uh, video, please. The experience of this mission and partnership by some might be called a mountaintop experience. By others, it might be considered a valley. You're either looking from a precipice with hope and opportunity or you're down thinking that the shadows and the weight of the need and the humidity of humanity's injustice is crushing. So we carry each with us our own set of bags through life. I think what this trip does that's unique is it breaks down some of those things in which we have thought that we're the only one that has experienced what we've experienced and it allows us to begin to open of ourselves so imagine for a moment that you're awoken by the clanging of pans in the background and the smell of rice dal and a few other indian spices you're not aware of as breakfast is being prepared and set out the team grabs a quick bite to eat and then shares a moment where we reflect on the past day, the challenges and the opportunities that we face together. We load into a couple of cars, a few small trucks loaded with equipment, maybe six to 10 50 pound bags of equipment and five to seven Americans load in the back of that as well as they wind their way down an Indian road and we pull out a diesel smell in the air and mixed with the water buffalo walking and the goats sharing the street. You pass a few individuals that are walking and you get the customary, hi, hello, how are you, what's your name? As we flow down that road past chili fields and cotton fields, teak forests, large trees that have been there for centuries, you wind over a few speed bumps where you're moving down single lane dirt roads with large diesel buses and trucks passing each other over a few streams and you roll up into a village, pulling into a walled small school compound, unloading bags surrounded by many kids. Hello, hi, how are you? Smiling faces that will be etched in your memory forever. Start to set up your equipment knowing that there are lines of people at registration standing out, dressed in their best, maybe the only outfit they have, some with shoes, but many without faces that are worn from working in the fields those are the patients you're going to be caring for your translators come up how can i help won't let you carry your bags or a box want to take them and set them in the rooms we set up all of the equipment and the lines are going and it starts So in walks an individual who looks both regal and worn with time, dressed in white, stick in hand. You sit down, conduct your examination, BIO on your head, you begin to shine lights. You find that there's nothing remarkable aside from a few IOLs that seem to be implanted. And as you inquire, he tells you that these were done by previous medical camps which were conducted with this team. As you slip in the lenses, he looks at the screen and all of a sudden you see a gigantic toothless grin. There was no one or two, three or four. It was a smile of sight that you experienced.
and it goes until six o'clock you hear we're, we've got 50 patients left at 10 p.m. You're closing up shop, quickly packing your BIO, wiping the sweat from your brow. A couple of Indian young men pick up an OCT, strap it in the back of a truck, load it up, seat belt on, tables ready to go. It's one of those things that even what I just described to you there as you heard the elements and the moments you have to experience. I shared that with you. I, I share that with all of you, whoever's listening to this, that you may want to try to capture or think that you understand from this video you're looking at. But until you're there and you spend the time and the sweat and the heat and you realize the end of yourself and you realize the end of resources and yet you see the way in which love is passed and hope is given, you can't encapsulate it in a video or a sound bite it is an essence that transforms your entire life. Can't help it every single time I see that video and I see the guy at the end there with his little smile on his face after having sight, it just it just breaks my heart, to be perfectly honest with you. I think if that can't elicit some compassion in you, you don't have any compassion to have, okay? I'm sorry, but uh, it's, it's quite a profound opportunity. And if God calls you to do a short-term or a long-term or an immediate-term mission, my encouragement to you is to do it. Um, it it'll, be, it'll be money and time well spent, and God will meet you in a pretty profound way. And I think that... Um, Hopefully that can encapsulate a little bit for you of what one of these medical trips looks like to India. Um, so so that's, that's the long and short of it. If you've got any questions, ask me or anyone from the church. Uh, we had about 31 on this trip, 31 in the, in the team, so we had a pretty large team uh, that helped out pretty Pretty, everybody worked really hard. You do this for six days. By the way, if you remember in the video, he said at 6 o'clock they tell you there's 50 patients left and then you're packing up at 10. The reason that is is because 50 patients to an Indian means 350 patients. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> it really doesn't mean 50. So uh, It's not that we kind of slow down at 6 o'clock all of a sudden. It's that we're, we're working hard uh, from that point forward generally to finish things off as best as we possibly can. Um, okay, so today we get the opportunity to kind of conclude the Beatitudes, and I have the opportunity to speak on probably what is the most pleasant Beatitude, right? Um, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. <laughs> I'll be honest with you, I struggled profoundly in trying to put together this message. I really did, because this, is, I believe, is a is, is just, it's just a hard message. There's no way to do it. I mean, I can't start out with a joke because that would be making light of something that's not to be made of light of. Um, I talked to Pastor Andrew uh, just the other day about this. As a matter of fact, it was kind of interesting. He shared with me that he had gone to Cambodia on a mission trip. And in that mission trip, they were doing a, a pastoral conference. So he was teaching pastors. And he said, and they went through 1 Peter together. And if you remember the themes of 1 Peter, especially in chapter 2 of 1 Peter and chapter 3, is suffering. He said, every single time we got to one of those passages, I asked the Cambodian leadership to get up and teach their own people because I really didn't have the background nor experience to do an effective job in those areas. And I, I could really relate to that. So... We're going to begin this morning by reading all the Beatitudes again together. We're going to go to Matthew chapter 5 and read verses 3 to 12 together. And then we're going to have a little bit of a game afterwards to see how much you grasp, okay? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you 
When others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account, rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Um, so I think I forgot to pray, so let's pray, okay? <laughs> Father um, in heaven, you are kind and good to us. You pursue us with your love in so many different ways, and we thank you for that, Lord God. Father, as we had this trip to India and we were able to be your servants in India, we thank you for that. As Faith Foster has arrived in Peru, we thank you for her and pray a blessing upon her and her team and pray that you would strengthen them. As we're about to send a missions team to, uh, to Modesto, Lord God, to pack food for those that are in need, we pray that you would bless them as well, Father God. And for this word that we're going to proclaim this morning, we pray that it would sink into our hearts. Even though my experience is not very strong in this area, I pray, O oh Holy Spirit, that we collectively, you through me, and us in listening to you could hear your voice speak to us. We pray your blessing. We ask your help, Lord Jesus. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so I'm going to read to you these verses back, but I'm going to read them in the message, which is a paraphrased version. And at the end of it, we're going to do a little bit of a game. So I want you to try to associate this back to the phrase in a more literal translation that you would use for this particular area. So verse 3, you're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there is more of God. This is what? Shout it out. I got the same reaction first service, okay? Go back to verse 3. What was verse 3? Poor in spirit. See, three words. Poor in spirit. Okay? Verse 4. You are blessed when you feel you've lost what is most dear to you. Only then can you be embraced by the one most dear to you. What is this? Morning. You are, verse 5, you are blessed when you're content with just who you are. No more, no less. That's the moment you find yourselves proud owners of everything that can't be bought. What is this one? Meekness. Verse 6, you are blessed when you've worked up a good appetite for God. His food, his food and drink in the best meal you'll ever eat. Okay, hunger and thirst for righteousness. You're blessed when you care. At the moment of being careful, you find yourselves cared for. Merciful. Verse 8. You're blessed when you, get your ins when you get your inside world, your mind and your heart put right. Then you can see God in the outside world. Pure in heart. That's an easy one. You're blessed when you can show people how to cooperate instead of compete or fight, that's when you discover who you really are and your place in God's family. Peacemaker. Peacemaker. Okay, and then I'll read the rest of the verses to you. Verse 10, 11, and 12. You're blessed when your commitment to God provokes persecution. The persecution drives you even deeper into God's kingdom. Not only that, count yourself blessed Every time people put you down or throw you out or speak lies about you to discredit me. What it means is that the truth is too close for comfort and they are uncomfortable. You can be glad when that happens. Give a cheer even. For though they don't like it, I do. And all heaven applauds. And know that you are in good company. My prophets and witnesses have always gotten into that or this kind of trouble. So some observations, some, a little bit of study. The first seven Beatitudes are more about us and what we are to be. So the first seven Beatitudes kind of identify attitudes that we're to portray. And then the eighth Beatitude fundamentally shifts from a what we are to be to what is going to happen to us. It's more process-oriented, verse 10, 11, and 12. So there's a shift that takes place. Now, if this was a sales presentation, 
it probably would be identified as the worst sales presentation in the world, right? Because you get these first seven beatitudes with all these great blessings, and then the eighth beatitude is what? Blessed are those who are persecuted. Guess what? For all this, you get persecution. Hallelujah. Just sign on the bottom line, if you would. Sign on the dotted line. Someone put it this way. Jesus is not about making life easy. He's about making men great. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, I don't know if you know who he is, but he was a German who, during World War II, stood up against the Nazis. He was a theologian. This is one of his quotes. He said, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. Wow, pretty heavy. So the word persecuted, what does it mean? The root of the word persecuted is twofold. It means to pursue or to chase. There's a modern commentator that suggests that the word persecuted would better be translated harass or harassed. Blessed are those who are harassed for righteousness sake. There's a certain harassment associated with it. The, the same commentator goes on and suggests that verses 11 and 12 are amplifications of verse 10. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. So I ask you a question, and I ask me the same question, because when I point a finger at you, three are pointing back at me. Remember that. Have you ever suffered persecution? Have you ever suffered harassment for righteousness' sake or for your, for your faith? If the answer is yes, my next question to you is, have you really suffered persecution for your faith? I don't mean going into Starbucks and not getting a Merry Christmas just like getting a happy holiday. That's not what I'm talking about here when I'm talking about persecution. I'm talking about a real harassment. But if you have suffered a harassment for your faith, I also ask another question. Have you suffered for the right reasons? Listen to these promises or words from the Scripture. 2 Timothy 3.12, Paul says this, Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Acts 14.22, Paul is speaking to the Antioch church, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. 1 Peter 3.14, but even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, implication, we won't always suffer for righteousness' sake, but sometimes we will, you will be blessed, have no fear of them, nor be troubled. So I go back to kind of uh, 2 Timothy 3.12. If persecution is promised, then why or why not have we suffered from it? So uh, let me share a personal story with you. Um, back in the day, many, many years ago, I worked in a steel plant back in Buffalo, New York. And the steel plant was Republic Steel. And I worked in a department called the Finishing Department. And what we would do in the finishing department, that was back in the day when there were leaf springs in cars, we would finish off the steel, it would be put in a, in, a, in a car, and then it would be shipped off to Detroit, and they'd make a car out of it, okay? One of the departments in this finishing department was called the chipping department. In the chipping department, the way you got paid was by tonnage. The more tonnage you could put out, the greater your incentives were. And you could make a lot of money in that department if you did. So the way the operation worked was there was a guy who was called an inspector, and he would inspect in a steel. If he saw a steel billet there and he noticed there was a big, long seam in it, he would mark the seam. And then a laborer would come behind, and the laborer would gouge out the seam. Now, this guy was a believer, this one I'm specifically talking about. He was a Christian. He was clearly a Christian. He would come and he would preach the gospel on a regular basis. But he had a problem. He worked slow as molasses. He was the slowest worker in the bunch. And all the workers were there to make money at that point in time. They didn't know Jesus. They just wanted to make money. And so this guy would preach the gospel to them, and he would get ridiculed and persecuted for it on a regular basis. Why? Because he didn't have credibility with the workers. He didn't first establish credibility with the workers that I'm in this with you guys and I'm going to work as hard as you guys want. This wasn't a moral issue. 
In fact, the guys told him, just go ahead and mark it. If you think it's a seam, we'll go ahead and cross-cut it with our, with our chipper. And if it cross-cuts as a seam, we'll gouge the seam out. If not, we won't even worry about it. We'll just pass on to the next one. So anything you think even comes close, just mark it. Just go fast. Please just go fast. He never learned the lesson. And as a result of it, he never had credibility with the workers. So the point is this. Sometimes persecution comes upon us, but sometimes it's of our own devices. We need to make sure that that persecution is for the right reason. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 19 to 20. For this is gracious, a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin or don't do what the guys want you to and are beaten for it, you endure. But if when you do good and suffer for, for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. God looks down and he says, look, if, if you are functioning graciously, if you are following the precepts that I set down for you, then I will look with favor upon you and there will be a blessing that will result from this. Another observation as you're looking through this set of verses, it switches from verse 10 from third person, those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, to second person in the very next verse. Blessed are you when you are persecuted. So, so and all of a sudden, Jesus is honing down on the personal. He said, I'm going to make this personal for you guys. I want you to think about it in personal terms. Now, I find this issue of persecution a difficult one to preach on in, in general to be honest with you. And anytime I've read these scriptures on persecution, there's kind of two or three themes that always come to mind for me. The first theme is this. Is Jesus my Lord? The book of Romans tells us in chapter 10, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you confess with your lips, confessing is agreeing. I agree that Jesus is Lord. And so one of the things I have to ask myself is Jesus my Lord. Do I walk this earth in the context of Jesus being my Lord or is he just my Savior? He's just the nice guy that comes along and covers my sin, or is he the guy that comes along and tells me what to do, when to do, how to do it? He formulates my thinking. My values are based on his values, not my own anymore. Because if he is Lord, and and he tells me, go to India, go to Africa, go to West Nigeria, my job at that point in time is to say yes. Not why, or are you sure? but it's a yes. So lordship is always a theme that comes to mind when I think about persecution. And kind of as sub-themes to that are obedience and sacrifice. Obedience. So let's, let's draw a, a scale, a 1 to 10 scale. One being, I am disobedient. I am not obedient when I'm told to do something. Ten being, I'm the most obedient how would you evaluate yourself? Are you a nine? Are you eight? Are you a seven? Are you a six? Are you a one? Are you a two? Am I a one or a two? Or am I a nine, eight, or a ten? And the easiest way I find with this litmus test for me is just read the scriptures. Do I obey what the scripture is telling me to obey? Do I do it? It's literal. I don't have to ask the question, is this God's will? Because it's God's will. It's in the Bible. It's God's will. So how do I do against it? Realistically, how do I do against it? And then the issue of sacrifice. And let's reverse the scale this time. One being kind of uh, not sacrificial. Well, maybe I guess we're not reversing the scale. And 10 being most sacrificial. Where would I rate myself on this order of sacrifice? Because when it comes to something like persecution, the ultimate sacrifice is self And so am I a nine, am I an eight, or am I a one or a two? And I believe that when we think about these things, it's not, a, it's not a switch. It's not a binary equation. It's not I am obedient or I'm disobedient. There's degrees of obedience and there's degrees of sacrifice. 
That's my opinion, at least. When I look at myself, I have to ask those questions. So we're going to look at three questions this morning as we go through these scriptures. Why is persecution for righteousness' sake a blessing? Why is there this defined paradox? What does persecution for righteousness' sake look like worldwide? What did it look like back then? What does it look like today? Because I think that's a question that needs to be explored, and I think it's a fascinating question because I believe, in my opinion, and I think I can give you the evidence, that in the West it's very different than it is in the East, or vice versa, it's very different in the East than it is in the West. And finally, how are we to react to persecution for righteousness' sake? What is this scripture telling us? So let's start with the divine paradox. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Why is this true? Why are we blessed? Why are we joyful? Why are we happy when we are persecuted? Let's go back uh, to Acts chapter 5. And we're not going to, I'm going to, I'm just going to kind of summarize Acts chapter 5. So Acts chapter 5 is when the apostles are doing great and mighty things. The Sanhedrin decides that these guys are trouble because too many people are getting converted to Jesus. So they arrest them and they bring them in before the Sanhedrin. It gets dark, it gets nighttime, they throw them in prison. In the middle of the night, an angel comes and does a prison break. Okay, and these guys are out. And the angel is very specific in his instructions. I want you to go to the temple and I want you to preach the gospel. He doesn't tell them to flee. He doesn't tell them to find safety. He says, tomorrow morning, go back in the temple and preach the gospel. Next day arrives, chief priest is there, chief priest comes, He starts uh, the the council together. He sends the guards to the prison. There's prison guards standing outside of the guard, but there's nobody on the inside. Can't believe it. But where are the apostles? They're in the temple preaching the gospel. Somebody whispers in their ears, if you really want to get those guys, go to the temple and get them and bring them. So he does. He goes to the temple, he gets them, he brings them back. And they stand before the Sanhedrin. And then it tells us in verse 41 this. He says, and then they, then they, they being the apostles, left the presence of the council. This is after, after they've been beaten by the council. Rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for his name. So these guys are rejoicing. We just suffered for the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let me give you some observations that, as I look at this story, I think are are things we need to consider. Clearly, these apostles were identified as Jesus' followers, not just by their words, but by their actions and by the signs that followed them. They were clearly identified as Jesus' followers. It's apparent, as you read the story and consider the story, that they counted their lives as small, their lives on this earth as small. They were willing to suffer for Jesus. Otherwise, they would have headed out of town really quick. As soon as they got out of jail, it would have been, hey, I got to get to safety. But no, what did they do? The next day, they go to the temple and they preach the truth of the gospel. So they counted their lives as, 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 as nothing in this earth. They were willing to suffer for Jesus. And then they were infused with this certain joy. So as you read this scripture, blessed are those or counted all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Where does this joy come from? Is it something that we're to work up? Are you and I, if we're ever persecuted, to work this joy up? I believe there is a certain infusion that God said, you are blessed and because you are blessed, I will bless you. And I think these are things that we need to consider for our own lives. Do we identify with the cause of Jesus? Remember what it said again. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Notice the transition. It changed from righteousness to my account. When we become persecuted for righteousness, we're becoming persecuted for Jesus.
One of the profound things about facing true physical persecution is the issue of coming to grips with our own mortality. It's identifying that we are one step closer to Jesus and we're willing to be one step closer to Jesus. Human limitations are true of each of us, and God recognizes that about us. That he will be there for us, and then he will give us the supernatural infusion of joy. Now let's talk about persecution. What was it like back then? So that was the Roman days. So let's assume you were a stone uh, cutter at that point in time, and somebody came to you and said, we want you to create an idol for us, or what if, what if you were a tailor? And somebody said to you, we want you to make robes for the priest for temple worship. How would you respond to that? So there's somebody that came to a man by the name of Tertullian who was, uh, lived about 100 AD, and this guy was a well-known Christian. And he, he came with this dilemma, what do I do? He said, what must I do? I must live, the guy asked after all this. And Tertullian's response was, must you? So was it loyalty or living that was the choice that was to be made? Social life, there were many feasts that were associated with sacrifices that were offered to idols. If you said no to your friend, how would that respond? Or how about family? All of a sudden, your wife becomes a believer and you're not a believer. How do you treat her? Or then there was the civil issues associated with not worshiping Caesar and the persecution that would become because of civil disorder. Now, what does persecution look like today? I think the answer to that question is that it's very different in the East than it is in the West. I think we in the West suffer from persecution in a completely different way than our friends in the East do. And I'm going to show you a video from North Korea of a gal that was persecuted in North Korea. For those of you that might be listening to this eventually in your car, this is in Korean, unfortunately. So stick with it for five minutes and then we'll be back. So go for it. Thank 
위해서 정말 많은 사람들이 옆에서 죽어가고 항상 주님께서 내 마음에 기둥이 되고 내 마음에 등대가, 등대가 되어주시고 그래서 항상 이 노래를 부를 때마다 자극기 눈물이 흐르게 되죠. 주님 우리가 너무 감사해서 나 같은 죄인 살리시기 좋은 해고 Why don't we take a minute and let's pray for the North Korean church and others that are being persecuted worldwide in this way. Father, um, there are many in North Korea and other places in the world, China, India, North Africa, West Africa, that are being persecuted for their faith in you, Lord Jesus. And we ask you on their behalf, that you would do a mighty and profound deliverance of them from the prison camps, from the tortures, uh, from the destitution that they are facing, Lord God. In the midst of this trial, Lord God, we pray that you would increase their faith, that they would recognize that you are still in control in a circumstance, in a situation they may feel so out of control. Lord God, we pray your divine blessing and your help, and we pray that whether it's here on earth someday or in heaven, we will meet them and hear how you have heard our prayers today and you have transformed their lives into something um, that's not as stressful or as crazy or as persecuted as it is right now. Lord God, we pray your blessing. We ask your help in Jesus' name. Amen. So I, I called Pastor Providas in preparation for this, me, this, uh, this message today, and I asked him, I said, share with me a story of one of the pastors maybe in India and what happened to him. And there was a guy by the name of Timothy who's a pastor, and it, it may be even somebody that Josh and I were able to ordain in the last couple of years when we traveled to, in, to India. He became uh, connected with an area pastor, and the area pastor then sent him off into the area that's called the forest area, which is where a lot of tribal people live. He went to the forest area to preach the gospel. 
On his travels, he was met by warriors for all intents and purposes. They beat the guy. They beat him unconscious. He woke up, he asked for water. They wouldn't give him any water. He had to walk a couple miles to actually get a drink from a very dirty pond. Um, he went back to his area pastor then, Timothy did, asking, can you give me another assignment? And I don't really want to go back here. The area pastor said, no, let's go back together. They went back together, uh, preached the gospel, but also brought a truck to, build, to, to, to dig a, a well at the same time. And so they dug a well so that these guys could have water in their locale as well. In the meantime, somebody from this village, this tribal village, got sick. The guys from the tribal village took this guy out to the bush and left him for dead. Timothy came along, nursed this guy back to health and prayed for him and asked God to miraculously and mightily heal him, and God did. That opened the door for the power of the gospel in that village, and Timothy was able to go back without persecution and preach the truth of the gospel, which is really, really one of those cool stories. There's another story I want to share with you that's related to um, some friends of ours from the church. Sissy and Kevin Maxwell have a friend in West Nigeria by the name of Phillips. And let me read to you a bit of an email that uh, Kevin sent to me some months ago about the situation there and also from Phillips' blog. I am writing to at least four of you who know Phillips. The crisis in Phillips' neighborhood is quieted down with martial law after 11 people were bludgeoned by Muslims attacking the Christians there. They were bludgeoned to death. Phillips is being violently, is being extremely cautious on Facebook to not incite violence, but is hearing the call to reach the perpetrators with the love of Christ. He is doing evangelistic work in Jaws, J-O-S, in the north where the Muslim population is high. He is in dangers that I cannot imagine. And here's a, a couple of, uh, of excerpts from, uh, from Philip's posts, I believe, on Facebook. Zamfara, uh, I think is how you pronounce the name of the area or the city. A state in desperation, I believe it's a state then, finally erupts in violence today. I knew Zamfara will come to this. The spat of killings, raids, and kidnappings by gunmen has reached a level that not an inch of space is safe anymore. You'll recall I took a dangerous round trip here last August. I had, have an emotional attachment to Zamfara because that, this is where I spent my formative years, eight years in Maru, where I finished my secondary school and had my NCE. I assume that's education after secondary education. I traveled the length and breadth of the state, visiting and spending days with my early childhood friends, all very devout Muslims. I spoke to a few of them today. One of them with his two wives and 16 children do not have food to eat because of these wicked invasions. The protest and destruction today is a reaction of a failed state. The people are protesting the inability of the government to protect them from gunmen as whole communities are raided every day and people are ambushed and kidnapped every day by the hundreds. The governor of the state, the minister of defense, who hails from the state have evacuated their immediate uh, and significant number of their extended families out of the state. It's a total state of anarchy. You will recall no less than 80 churches have been closed down. I lost about four of my colleague, colleagues and probably over 200 people that belongs to the same church with me. This is not to talk of other believers whom we share a common bond together. This is also not to talk of the scores of good and devout Muslims who spend all their lives taking care of their families, many of whom committed suicide because they can't stand to see their children languish in hunger. We can't rejoice when innocent citizens are decimated and so many deaths recorded because of a few capitalist interests who gloat and use the power, the blood of the poor to stay in power. The increasing threat to our nation's security is the increasing hunger that is ravishing our homes and communities. This post was December 24th, 2018. I just think of the significance of that. It's just kind of crazy. Um, so physical persecution still occurs in the world. 
primarily as I tend to see it, it tends to occur in the East more than in the West. So I ran across this article in, from Biola University. It's about studying nine Chinese pastors who went through persecution. And if you flip that slide up there and I'll read it. Nine Chinese pastors who had experienced religious persecution to the extent of confinement were interviewed about their experiences during the persecution. The effect related to their sufferings and their ways of coping. Results showed that the suffering and religious persecution involved losses of personal freedom, physical trauma, spiritual isolation, and collapse of social support. Eight themes emerged as unique ways to respond and cope during the suffering. First was experiencing God's presence. Second, letting go and surrender to God. Third, identification with the passion of Christ and his disciples. Next, preparing to suffer. Next, normalizing their suffering. Next, worshiping and reciting scriptures. Next, fellowships and family support. And finally, believing in a greater purpose. The first three of the coping met me me methods significantly predicted positive effect. Now catch this next statement. It just, I, I just find this quite amazing and flabbergasting and part of the reason why persecution is a blessing. The pastors also reported transformation after the suffering, which can be categorized into four themes. Switching the focus from self to churches. My interpretation of that statement is it gets rid of our selfish juices. It begins, we begin to value others as more important than ourselves. Next, embracing the humility and limits within ourselves. Item number two for me is crushing, crushing pride, basically. Item number three, increased trust in God's provision. And item number four, redefining their views on suffering from something that was very negative to something that was more positive. So what does persecution look like in our culture, in the West? What does harassment look like in our culture in the West? Let me give you some ideas or examples as I thought through this a little bit. One of them might be something like a man getting passed over for, or a woman getting passed over for a promotion, or getting passed over for a job because they put something on their Facebook page that indicates that their values are conservative Christian values. Or a woman who would be ostracized by her friends because she doesn't use Instagram anymore decides to get off Facebook. Or a young man at school who decides that he doesn't want to be part of a, a sexting scheme or, or, or some sort of a hazing scheme in school and so all of a sudden he's ostracized. But there is a fourth item. I read an apologist on this, a philosophical apologist, and the fourth item I will call is this, indiscriminate tolerance. Think about those two words. I believe our society today is driving a point home, and the point it's trying to drive home is that you and I need to adopt indiscriminate tolerance. Chuck Smith would call this moral relativism. It's the anything goes. If it feels good to me, if it feels right to me, then it goes. And if you or I don't indiscriminately tolerate that thing, then we're a hate monger. We're wrong. Jesus never had indiscriminate tolerance. Jesus tolerated the sinner, yes, but he never tolerated the sin. And this, I believe, is the disease, if you will, the social order disease of, our, of, of the West in general. Another way to put it would be that from a social perspective, there are no absolute values. The Bible is just completely opposite to that. Think about the whole gender identity thing. No longer is the way someone is born, physically born, identifying them with a certain gender. It's how they feel at a certain age. And so I ask you, if tomorrow I come in and say I feel like a tree, does that make me a tree? 
So let me conclude this one section by saying this. Persecution is still alive and well in the world. And it's, it's, it's found in a very different form in the East than it is in the West. Um, I think that that is true. But how do we respond to this? Say we are faced with persecution. How are we to respond? It says we're to react with joy. Again, verses 11 and 12. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter other all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So why do we rejoice? We rejoice because our reward in heaven is great. That word great in the Greek literally means immeasurably great. It's not just great, it's beyond expectation great. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 17 and 18, For this light, momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, that which is around us, that which we inhabit this body it's transient but the things that are unseen are eternal second timothy 4 7 and 8 paul said it this way i've fought the good fight i have finished the faith i have kept i have finished the race i have kept the faith henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness which the lord the righteous judge will award to me on that day and not only to me but also to all who have loved his appearing why else should we rejoice? Because we're in good company. Jesus says this, look, the, the, the prophets came, they were persecuted. My witnesses came, they were persecuted. Rejoice! Rejoice in this! If you suffer persecution for the faith, rejoice in it. God thinks it's, it's good. He looks down and sees it. He knows it's going to form you and I into a person that he wants us to be. So how do we conclude this whole message? Let me give you four uh, items that I think we should walk away with. One is this, pray. Pray for those in the East who are suffering persecution. Although it's transformative, it is not easy or fun. We all know that. It's not easy or fun suffering persecution. Pray for our society. Our society claims that tolerance uh, uninhibited tolerance is a, is a divine virtue. It is not that. It is not that, by any stretch of the imagination. Take a long view of life. I ask you this, what's your view of life? Is it, is it, is it so stayed in the transient, in this body, that there's no long view? That if God says, look, I want you to sacrifice this body that we could do that. Take a long view. Do you view yourself as an eternal creature or a temporal creature? Do I view myself as an eternal creature or a temporal creature? I hope I view myself as eternal. I just happen to inhabit this body at this juncture of my existence. And then last of all, submission to the Lord. Is Jesus Lord? What does that mean? It means that if Jesus says, jump, I don't say, why? I say, how high? Then Jesus is Lord of my life. Is Jesus Lord? I think it's something that we all need to wrestle with. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, confession is agreement, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I believe it's Romans 10, verses 8, 9, and 10. This is, this is a challenging, challenging message in my estimation. Uh, this is probably the most challenging of all the Beatitudes because it really sums it up quite succinctly and frankly and also lets us know that this walk with Jesus is more than a cakewalk. There is, in fact, a walk that Jesus calls us to that is sacrificial in its orientation. His sacrifice was much greater than my sacrifice could ever, ever be or yours could ever, ever be. 
So why don't we pray for those in the, uh, in the east? Why don't we pray for those in the west? And, and we'll close with prayer for ourselves as well. Father, we come before your throne as a group of people that recognizes that some of our friends on the other side of the world are being hurt, destroyed, burned, electrocuted, um, amputated, all the different ways that torture is occurring on them. And Lord, we pray for their deliverance. We recognize that in the West, Lord God, we in the developing nations, there is a progressiveness that is insidious and deceitful. That Jesus, you were the preacher of tolerance, but indiscriminate tolerance? Never, Lord God, did you preach that. And so we come against the forces of the evil one who try to take a good concept and turn it into something wrong and evil. And for ourselves, O oh Lord, um, help us to be honest with ourselves to recognize when we are fully submitted to you as Lord and when we are not. And Lord God, if not is the reality, then Father, help us to value you in such a fashion that we're willing to give ourselves to you completely. So, Father, as we stand and sing this last song, we pray, Lord God, for your blessing. We pray for your wisdom. We pray for your mercy. We pray for your grace. We pray that we would understand you better and see you more clearly than ever before.